Hi, so here we are for the next lecture, another important principle, principle of specificity. So individualism we've covered, we've covered progressive overload, we're covering specificity. And in the next one, there would be the principle of uh, reversibility, which will be done by Varun. And there's going to be a very interesting uh, one after that, uh, which I have kind of devised a name for it but interesting and very interesting and very applicable. So make sure you, of course, listen to that carefully as well. But this one here, right now, we're focusing on the principle of specificity. So we're saying that, no, you have to be specific, right, in this principle. So for this, I would want you to look at this picture. There's a picture I've uh, looked for and I've put it here. What is that picture? What does it show you? Have a look, take your time make meaning out of that picture. Okay, so you've got some time there. You've seen there's a picture, right? In that picture, there's a plant. There's something that looks like a fruit. It seems to be a tomato. Okay. And that fruit which is there or that vegetable which is there here, in this case specifically a tomato. It has obviously grown on a plant over a period of time. What does this picture say? If I had to say that this is not a tomato, this is an, this is a mango or this is a watermelon, you would obviously look at it and say, hey, no, that can't be. It's not uh, a watermelon. What if I say that this is a tomato maybe yes but when the seed was planted the seed was not for a tomato the seed was maybe a mango seed and then the tree grew and it started giving tomatoes or tomatoes as the Americans say what do you think can that work does that happen can you plant a mango and get a apple or you get a watermelon common sense will tell us obviously not right so this picture should give you an idea. What you, what you sow is what you reap. Or like it says here, you reap what you sow. So in Hindi, like they say, you know, jo bo boenge, wohi paenge. So the seed that you plant is what you'll get. And this is the whole idea behind the principle of specificity. What you do is what you'll get. What you train for is what you'll gain. You can't be doing something else and expecting something other. So this is the principle. If we understand this, then we know what to do to get something. Okay, it's understanding that process. So it's understanding what seeds to sow to get the results you want. This is the basic principle, the basic wisdom. And if we understand this, everything else sort of falls into place. Okay. So now we get to the principle of specificity. Some of the things which are important in the principle of specificity. What is the principle of specificity? Like I said earlier, you do certain things to gain certain things, right? And what are those certain things? You have to be very specific. If you want to be strong, you want to be strong to be able to lift an X amount of weight over your head for whatever reason you want to do that. Will running help that? Will stretching help that? Obviously not. You would have to lift a weight which is equal or close to that to be able to lift it at some point in time, right? So this is what is the basic principle of specificity, specificity, where you do specific things to achieve specific results. And what are the things that you do to get those is what is the list here, okay? There's mode of training, what type of mode do you apply? Then there's the muscle fiber types, recruitment, recruitment, training outcomes, what do you expect to get out of training, the joint loading, certain angles you load the joint to get certain results at those angles and then concentric eccentric and isometric contractile adaptations like in uh, training what do you want in a certain contraction what do you want to gain so that is what it is and very interesting uh, listen carefully you learn a lot these principles really is like knowing which medicine to give to which patient so once you can understand this you'll know exactly what to do with various exercises and various exercise programs out there okay so now we go to the next slide which is first is the mode of training so when we say mode okay of training it is nothing but 
that specific style of training you choose weight training you choose you know cardiovascular you choose flexibility whatever okay that will make you strong and better in that particular respect so this once you get like i keep saying you know it makes it easier to understand a lot of other issues and a, a lot of other things so here i have put a very interesting thing on top treadmill versus ground running we all know that people run on a treadmill right in a gym or in a center they run on a treadmill they can run at various speeds so if i give you an example of somebody who's running say who who does a uh, good amount of running maybe a speed of let's say a uh, 15 okay 15 kilometers uh, per hour that's a pretty decent speed you know for someone to do and they can do that uh, for maybe 1 minute they sprint and then they slow down and then they do it again but that's the speed that they can reach maximally and then there's somebody who runs on the ground can this person who runs on the treadmill at this speed just be put on a ground maybe in a competition and said you run okay so you can reach the speeds that the best in the world do do it on a treadmill get on the ground run okay and do you think it works i would want you to think about this it would be nice if it worked right it would actually be nice that then we don't have to get anybody on the ground you just make them run on a treadmill what happens on a treadmill are you moving from point a to point b or are you in the same spot no matter how much distance the treadmill shows obviously you're in the same spot in sport do you stay in the same spot and play football think right another thing to ask when you're moving forward on the ground there are certain muscles which are used for propulsion okay your gluteus maximus your quadriceps a lot which will help you go forward what is happening here on a treadmill when the ground is rather moving under you and you are in the same spot are those muscles working the same time to think okay another thing okay on a treadmill it gives you time right it gives you even calories how many calories you've burnt what if you start a treadmill it gets to a certain speed and you get off the treadmill still keeps running it gives you a time it can't read if there's a person on top or not so some of those scores you get you can still get even if you step off some of those scores are pre-programmed again pre-programmed it gives you a score whether you're on it or off it you have to then think how much sense does it make a lot of times to do a movement on a treadmill one more thing and very very important here let's say there's a football player most sports football table tennis boxing there's a lot of lateral movement right there's a lot of stop start turn on a treadmill do you stop and start again do you do lateral movements can you do lateral movements if you're running you could be running at speed 15 16 very good running stroke you know style can you move laterally and in sport do you need to move laterally of course there's a lot of sports you know and that's where the difference is so these are all points to think okay you have to use the right mode to gain the right results if your sport requires lateral movement running on a treadmill maybe won't help you as much because it will get your lungs to work but will it help those lungs to work along with your legs when you have to stop start and change direction think about this you should have the answer for this okay what about the next weight training you know when you want to do weight training to get stronger and you want to you know uh, get sort of like i gave the example earlier you want your shoulders to be strong okay and you want them to be strong so that you can use them for maybe uh, say a punch okay you want to be good in throwing a good karate punch or you want to be good in throwing a boxing punch okay a good combination can running make your shoulders stronger running is of course good for health so this is where again application comes in obviously running won't make your shoulders stronger running will help you with running and it can help you indirectly with your cardiovascular endurance so choosing the right mode to get the right results is extremely important body weight training and this is again very interesting because many people would say you know that yes to get strong i can do push ups you know you can do a bench press of course but you can also do push ups and similar movement right you kind of take your arms back here so there's a bit of horizontal 
abduction horizontal adduction right you're going in this your pec major stretches your pec major shortens good movement both are both the same there's a bench press do the same as a push-up and if you're doing a push-up for some other sports which are into a lot of force requirement short put rugby can they just do a push-ups because the action is the same can that work for somebody who does short put who needs immense power to shoot uh, throw that ball obviously not because the level of force requirement is very different in those sports so body weight exercises will serve a certain purpose of control of having good coordination your whole kinetic chain working as one but weight training has its own place so it's like medicine okay where we need to know exactly what we want from which exercise flexibility okay when we talk about flexibility can i stretch can i do a lot of stretching exercises every day and say that i'm strong and this will help me get strong obviously not again okay so these are things which we have to understand right that what you do what you train for is what you'll gain you can't do something else and expect something else like I, the example earlier you can't plant a mango and expect an apple to grow out of the tree so this is the basic wisdom of it right the said principle it's called the said principle it's basically specific adaptations to impose demands the name itself gives the idea your adaptation will happen according to specific demands that you've placed okay so specific adapt you can expect specific adaptations meaning imposed demands the imposed demand is what the demand that has been put on the body you've been doing say you know over time taking uh, dumbbells and doing shoulder presses so the demand is that your shoulder has been sort of loaded with that exercise okay you're doing a military press or you're doing dumbbell shoulder presses you're doing an arnold press different loads or you're doing a clean and jerk okay so there will be specific adaptations if you're doing a push press okay and if you're doing a clean and jerk you know where it's explosive then that adaptation will be different to somebody else who's doing slow movements though it's with heavy weights but these two will be different and this again will be covered in the uh, power um, chapter where we talk about velocity and force and the whole uh, curve but this is again to understand okay very important that you will gain specific uh adaptations and you will get specific benefits from specific things that you do so you have to know what you do that's why it's very important to understand what you do if you know what you do you can predict what you'll get but if you don't know what you do then your results also will vary and sometimes we might do things which i've gone through earlier because they look good but if they look good are they getting you results which you actually wanted out of that athlete so this is something again to think okay so these are the first uh, things that i've mentioned the mode of training which help us to understand why we're doing something to get specific results now we move on to muscle fiber recruitment so now whoever's in strength and conditioning most personal trainers at least we would have a basic idea that we have different types of muscle fibers okay we have what's called the slow twitch we have what's called the fast twitch and then there's something in between slow twitch as the name suggests these are fibers which are slower they don't they are the fibers which cannot produce a lot of force or a lot of speed so slow twitch fibers are the ones which have a lot of endurance okay they use a lot of the aerobic metabolism okay whereby you are able to last long so somebody like a marathon runner Okay, they can just go on and on they have good endurance they can last long but can that marathon runner be put under a heavy squat bar and said you squat heavy like a power lifter can they do that definitely not right so we have to understand that these muscle fibers you train them you can't expect results for the other muscle fibers so you have to train for what you want to gain okay so if you're doing movements which are with light weights high repetitions okay and your sport doesn't require too much force then this is the type of training you need to do okay for somebody who needs large amount of forces large amounts of speed a 100 meter sprinter short putter 
a 50 meter sprinter in swimming okay what do they want they want obviously to be very fast and they want to have a lot of force so they can jump and really get all the speed they can which type of muscle fibers would they need the fast twitch fibers and within the fast twitch there are two types okay the extreme so there's your um, slow twitch then there's fast twitch which do the exact opposite they basically are used whenever you do any heavy training you do high speed training so those are the ones which are the other extreme which are called type 2 but type 2b and there's in between something which is called type 2a okay so there's type 1 and then there's type 2b which is right here which is the most fibers will give you the most uh, speed and uh, force and here is the one which is in between they kind of uh, believe over training to even change their characteristics so as you start doing only heavy these in between ones also develop some of the characteristics of the heavy training if you do more of light training you will over time develop these muscle fibers to become like the others but the pure fast ones you can't completely change their character and make them into slow ones okay and the slow ones you can't just know make them into complete fast ones so this is something that these muscle fibers do and this is the training adaptation that takes place so you can see that in the chart i've given you know slow twitch fibers uh, they have low force if you look at the fast twitch type 2 they produce the most force the exact opposite okay so they can produce the most force uh, slow twitch fibers have great endurance the fast twitch type 2b fibers uh, the ones at the bottom right they have the most uh, they have the low to lowest endurance the ones on top slow have the greatest they can last long the fast twitch fibers uh, are the ones which sort of you know get tired very fast in the energy systems the slow ones are more aerobic in nature the fast twitch fibers type 2b are more anaerobic in nature okay so which are the sports that would be using them slow twitch obviously marathon running uh, sports that require long amount of endurance uh, tennis uh, you have uh, badminton again you have football uh, the fast twitch are uh, purely in which sports which you would need most is of course you would need it in shot put you would need it in 100 meters a uh, sprint you would need it also uh, to a large extent in uh, your javelins you know so anything which is a full burst of energy for one shot that is what will require fast twitch now many sports and we have to understand this okay though this is very interesting to say that okay fast twitch fibers are good for you slow twitch will make you slow a lot of sports require everything you take a case of football are you sprinting all the time or are you also jogging in between are you sometimes even walking waiting for the ball to pass right so there's different movements that happen you take a case of badminton are you just jumping and hitting a smash all the time or are you playing fine strokes as well so a shoulder is it only requiring fast fast twitch or is it your intermediate muscles also and slow that are working as well this is important to understand because then you can create a program which works on all these so just focusing on heavy lifting or fast movements because they look good or, or they feel good or you feel fast people also need to last long so in a match you don't just want to be able to kick hard or to be able to punch hard you also want to be able to punch for long as well so that's the reason why you have to work on all the qualities and all these fiber types training okay you have to be able to recruit and train these fibers so they get used to certain loads and what is sometimes important to understand in this point i would say sometimes people say you know that okay can i just train um, my light uh, my slow fibers and just become very fast again it's not going to happen okay and that's why how do we make sure that we get more fast twitch fibers you're born with those Usain Bolt is a special individual who's born a lot with that of course he has worked a lot after that but we have to understand that fast twitch fibers people are born with a certain amount some people are born with a greater number of slow twitch fibers we can of course train and change the uh, or load our muscle fibers accordingly so that we develop some strength or endurance but you can't completely change how you're born and that's why a lot of power athletes sometimes they say they are born they are born with some special qualities and then of course they learn a skill where they have they are able to use 
on that power. So this is a, a point to understand, hope you've got this, the muscle fiber recruit, recruitments. You can do some reading on this as well, but this is something which will help you design good programs if you know exactly what muscle fibers do in which type of movements. Now coming to heavy lifting versus lightweight training. By now, you should know, can lightweight training make you as strong as somebody who's lifting heavy? And can just heavy lifting make you build endurance to last long? You should have an answer by this, by now. What about sprints? Somebody who does sprints and maybe a simple uh, example here. Okay, there's Usain Bolt, very famous. A lot of sprinters, very famous. Can, why don't they take part if they're so fast? Why don't they take part in a marathon or in the longer events in the Olympics and win those as well? If you think of it, very interesting, isn't it? Somebody who's the fastest in the world, why don't they take part in something that is slow and long? Why can't they do that? would be nice if they could just take part and win that as well. It's like if I'm able to lift 100 kilos and I get a medal for lifting and then there's some, a sport where I just have to lift 10 kilos but for a long time. Quite easy, isn't it, for the 100 kilo uh, lifter to go and think like, I can lift of course 10. You should have an answer to that as well by now. Okay? The different qualities build, different, uh, different training builds different qualities. A sprinter can't just get into a marathon and say, I'll just run slow and win that as well. And at the same time, a marathon runner who has so much of stamina can't just get into 100 meters and say, I'll beat all of them because I can run for so many hours. Okay, so these are very important things to understand for us that different training outcomes will come out of different programs and you should know exactly what you're training for. So if you know what you're doing, then you know what you can expect. Static stretching. Now, static stretching, dynamic stretching, PNF stretches, which are sometimes called even your um, uh, muscle energy techniques, right? So, static stretching, what is it? You know, if you're lifting, say you're doing a simple stretch like this, you're holding on, you're doing a gomukhasan and in there for a while. That is a static stretch because you're not moving. Dynamic is where you're moving. Would dynamic help in a warm-up or would static help in a warm-up? dynamic would help more obviously because you're preparing the joints to move static would help more in post uh, playing you know when you want to get back you want to sort of you know cool down but of course static can also help if your muscles are extremely tight some muscles like your gastronomius your calves uh, pec major then sometimes it can still help you know in certain sports to loosen it a bit but dynamic is going to do the greater job in warm-ups pnf proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation yes i got it okay this is something which confuses a lot of people you know just the name is so um, kind of uh, long and uh, very uh, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation sounds very uh, sciencey very scary what does it do and what is that stretch in the practicals we'll be showing you a few stretches of these very effective stretching uh, which gets results very fast if you do those your end range can improve and you can be stronger in your end range you know so these again if you do those you can expect results for those uh, can anybody do pnf stretching should anybody and everybody do that somebody who has never stretched must who's maybe somebody who's older would dynamic stretches be fine for an elderly person obviously not in sport fitness wise we can do pnf stretching so there's there's that prescription no? everything's good Nothing in this is bad or nothing is less important. But we have to understand that you have to be able to apply what uh, is required at the right time. And PNF stretching, as we do the practicals, do listen to them and follow those. And I'll be showing some moves there which will help you okay, in creating some good uh, stretching protocols for your athletes. Now coming to generic exercises okay, and specific exercises for specific results. Generic sounds so nice, isn't it, when we say something like uh, badminton players should train like this. Badminton players should do what? Skipping. Okay. All badminton players should skip. Okay. Uh, if you are a rugby player, you should be doing clean and jerk. Okay. Has to be because that's how we see videos. Right. A uh, swimmer. A swimmer has to have a strong core core stability because they have to float in the water and it's a very different sport in a way there's there's no um, uh, 
ground reaction force other than when they do their starts. Sounds nice that when we say you know, generalization, that's why in, in general, generalization feels nice to hear. Specific knowledge can help solve specific problems. So that's why we have to understand to create specific programs and exercises for specific problems, if you may call it, in a sport. I'll give you an example here. When swimmers come to me, okay, and I've worked with so many swimmers in the country, you know, some of the best, I've been fortunate to work with them. So if a swimmer comes to me, should I say that you're a swimmer? So here we are training swimming exercises. And this is again, sounds nice to hear, swimming exercises, you know, we are going to make you do swimming movements. So what do we do? We'll put maybe a bozu ball, we'll get some Swiss ball and do swimming moves. Okay, again, we'll make a nice video on Instagram and post it. Does that make sense? So what do you have to remember? If somebody comes to you, and again, I'm giving you a good tip here, okay, something that works, you find out exactly what they want to improve in that sport. A swimmer just doesn't come to you because they want to do exercises to get faster. Find out what is their weakness in, say, a 100 meter freestyler. What is their weakness? Is it their start? Is it their dive? Is it their dolphin kick? Is it their turn? Or is it their finish? So is it their legs that are weak, where they are not able to have a good start, there's probably less force, and they can't really get a good distance in the dive? Or is it their arms that give up? Or could be the core? Or is it their lungs? Their lungs give up and towards the end they sort of feel I was very fatigued, so I couldn't complete the race. Why couldn't you complete? What was it that stopped you? My legs gave up, or my shoulders gave up, or my lungs gave up. This is what you have to find. And then you give them medication accordingly. The medication is your exercises. So I hope this clears, you know, and this makes you understand that you have to know exactly what the problem is to give the right solution. And if you don't ask the problem, what solution are you giving? So this is something to understand, okay? We have to know what the person wants in that sport, in that event. Now, somebody who's a freestyle swimmer has come and says they want this. And then there's somebody who's a breaststroker. Now, the breaststroker, it's obviously uh, an event which has a short axis of movement, okay? Your arms are not like in uh, freestyle where they're extending fully and just going over this. So long axis versus a short axis um, strokes. You have to know exactly in breaststroke which muscles are used. And again, what is it that they want? Is it for them, you know, as they are going and pulling, which part is it that they want to get strong? And then you choose an exercise or exercises which help them for that. But you can't just say, you know, that, oh, breaststrokers, all breaststrokers will give them a medicine ball. Nice, cool looking exercise, hold, you know, do a um, medicine ball uh, chest pass. Okay. And it looks nice. It looks exactly mimics sort of that action. You have to find out, maybe they are already very good at it. And maybe, you know, they are kicking, uh, the, the whipping action at the end is where they need help. So, understanding sport, and in the previous lectures, I've gone through different types of sports. You have to get into sport to know exactly what the actions are. You can't just have a generic approach about sport, thinking that, no, oh, this is what is done in sport, and that's why I'm going to do this for this particular sport. Okay, so hope this clarifies on how to create a specific program for a specific athlete for their problems. Now coming to joint loading angles, another interesting aspect. When somebody is um, lifting, okay, say now shoulder press, all right, now they are training from here to here, right? So this is the range. If you look at the humerus from here, it's going all up, okay, all the way down, not exactly 180 degrees, but still this is this would be considered a full range of motion, right? You might not be able to uh, see my arm as it uh, goes up, but still you kind of get the idea, right? Now, somebody who's training with weights, okay, and is training only from here to here, this is what we can call the inner range, right? Because this is coming from the central axis to midway in the range, and this we can call the outer range. Right? If it's biceps, then we can call from here to here the outer range and it comes closer 
okay, in a range. So there are various ranges, you know, here if you look at the pec major and we go to chest and you can look at the same, you know, you go outer range, okay, end range, what is also sometimes called and inner range, okay. Inner range is generally where most people are strong, okay. Outer range is where their joints or any joint is at its weakest because it's extended. The ligaments that are holding the joint capsule is having the most amount of load and tension. So you will get strong in the range that you train in. So if there's a person who is taking okay, a load and is going from here to here in the inner range, great, they are working their shoulders in this range. They are not going to get strong here. Same can apply for maybe even a, a bench press. If I am sort of standing sideways and if you can see and I am doing this action and I am used to doing bench presses half, okay, I will get strong in this range. My humerus is used to moving from here to here. It is not used to moving here. Sometimes when people do uh, maybe even uh, exercises such as you know chest flies, you hold a dumbbell and you go out. If you are used to only taking your humerus till here and you are not taking it to its end range, you will not get strong here. Obviously, you will get strong here. Now, when you play a shot which is something like a uh, tennis uh, stroke uh, which is sorry about that uh, just a phone call uh, so if you're playing a tennis stroke which is going from here right and they are going to hit a forehand so from here check where the elbow is right you are really stretching the pecs and you're then controlling your whole core kicks in a nice shot some people really extend and play so they have to be strong here. What if they are not used to training, they have never gone till here. Can then weight training help or in fact sometimes it can even be counterproductive because you are used to only loading the pec major till here, even the biceps in an isometric position here. They are just not, if they are not used to going to that range where the muscle goes in the sport, you are not going to be strong in that range. Okay, And most injuries happen like I said in the end range. So knowing how to work okay understanding full range training versus partial range you know partial range won't help you get to the end range and having strength inner range training if you only do inner range and not much outer range not going to help okay uh, isolation movements versus complex movements now, isolation movements are again you know specific such as leg extensions you do basic uh, single joint movements uh, such as tricep press downs and complex movements are such as squats your big uh, movers you know such as your deadlifts bench presses multiple joints are used uh, power cleans uh, clean and jerks so these are complex moves now in sports sometimes what gets a bad reputation is isolation movements people sometimes say hey anything which you do sitting on a machine is not really functional yes there's some amount of truth in that that you know you don't have to be doing only isolation movements sitting on maybe a leg extension machine and doing that will not help you to work on something where you kick a ball using the hip flexors knee extensors your you know plantar flexors all of them producing power it might not help you as much but we cannot deny the fact that it will strengthen your quadricep and that skill which comes in kicking doesn't come from the gym. You don't become a good footballer or a good kickboxer because you do squats. You are a good kickboxer and then you do squats to help you kick better. So that's why you cannot have, you know, a lot of people have this thing like all isolation movements are bad. Strength and conditioning shouldn't have these movements. No, there's no such thing as right or wrong. Some movements will help. Even isolation movements will strengthen. We have to understand that there is no doubt that load will strengthen. That load, if it's free weight, it will have some specific adaptations, but it will still strengthen. We cannot assume that, you know, somebody will not get strong doing leg extensions or maybe doing any other movement, which is an isolation move. So we have to know exactly uh, what we need, but we don't have to also be so involved in only doing complex movements that we think that only a squat is the best thing that can be done. Okay. And there can be cases where complex movements itself give you injuries or give you strains and I'll give you an example let's say somebody 
is a very tall athlete is not able to do squats properly because of the height um, long uh, um, body when they go down like many tall people now you can notice their knees buckle in and they go down like this and come up now do you say that hey but squats you know that's the king of all exercise how can you not do squats uh, squats are supposed to make you you know the give you really strong legs how can you be doing uh, leg extensions you know and not doing uh, squats now for someone who's not able to do squats you can build up by working on their quadriceps strength through leg extensions through maybe wall chair work on their lower back strength separately make them do back extensions different variations of the superman you can make them do some uh, good stretches for the calves if their calves are strong if that's the limiting factor the achilles tendon is not able to stretch and about to go down so you can do all this work on their glutes you can do hip thrusts and then teach them a squat so you break down the movement break down the chain you make everything strong and then get there that is more likely to give you some good results rather than forcing someone to do uh, action which they are just not comfortable and you just keep pushing and pushing and something breaks the same can be applied to an exercise such as the bent over barbell row a lot of people try this many of them don't get the form right they end up hunching and just trying to do and we keep sometimes forcing them hey, you know this is you not the right way you make sure you push your butt back keep a good strong stable core and then do it if they're not able to what do you do you rather work on their lower back strength work on them let them maybe use a cable machine first you know same goes for explosive lifts somebody can't have that speed maybe their shoulders are just not strong enough to take that bar up now should you force them saying no but that's how the, we, we are strength and conditioning coaches you know explosive lifts are like our bread and butter if you don't do those you are not really training as an athlete again these are questions you have to ask yourself okay you can't just be uh, thinking that you know certain things have to be done you have to know why you're doing them and you have to know what to use and sometimes something that doesn't appear very uh, effective can still be effective and that moment in time especially when someone's coming back from an injury and they're just coming back and they're slowly getting do you want to push them into complex movements where they're just you know trying to do something which they can't it's heavy do you want to load again these are the answers you need to have now coming to something uh, essential which i guess almost everybody knows and should know you should definitely know about this if you're into any form of snc the different contractions right you have your concentric eccentric isometric so what are concentric which are against gravity most of the time okay up eccentric is what where you're controlling it against gravity okay control isometric is what where you're stabilizing you're holding okay so concentric contractions you want to be lifting in such a way that you can you know you want to have good force you want to be a sprinter you definitely need to be lifting weights to be able to move so that you can accelerate what do you need eccentric contractions for for deceleration where does deceleration come in maybe not much in 100 meter sprints football you rush with the ball okay and you're coming closer to the goal post what do you have to do you have to slow down okay badminton you hit a smash land you're moving towards the net can you just sprint through the net obviously not you have to slow down near the net control stop play a shot again explode back so that's concentric you have eccentric to slow down after eccentric what happens let's say you slow down and now you have to move this side that's where your isometric comes in you slow stop that is what is called stabilization change direction so now which one is the most important in sports which require a lot of force without a doubt the concentric becomes important so that they can lift heavy because they need force you know shot put like i said uh, javelin hammer throw you know these are proper sort of sports which require a lot of force and speed right velocity speed both is required sports which are co- more continuous where they start stop which ones required you need eccentric training as well sports where there's change of direction stabilization without a doubt okay and a lot of um, if you look at literature it will tell you you know for sports to prevent injuries you have to do stability training as well and sometimes i feel from what i have seen of a lot of strength coaches and a lot of uh, people who prescribe programs one of the um, contractions that they miss and the programming that they miss is isometric because isometric are quite boring you know holds are boring right 
uh, we are so used to just lifting, lowering. So most people will focus on concentric. Some will still focus for preventive um, sort of measures, you know, so that the muscle can withstand more load. They will still focus a bit on uh, eccentric. But uh, isometric is very rare. And isometric is so important, you know, and it helps you so much. The control and the confidence that will come in a joint stabilization with isometric just is, is so, so good. But most people don't. So use these, understand these, okay, and you should be able to work on all contractions in majority of sports. Only in some that require pure strength, then of course it's understandable. But majority will need this. And even then, for sports that require a lot of force, you can still do eccentric loading whereby you, you know, take almost 15% heavier load than what you can take. And you lower that load by yourself, get a spotter to lift. This is done you know, in a lot of strength training programs where you go down in a squat with a heavy load, control, eccentric, while coming up somebody helps you, you know, again you go down by yourself. So that again can help, you know, because any movement, even if it's concentric force, you need to have the coil and uncoil effect, right? If somebody is going to even throw a punch, what do you do? You can't just start from here. You have to go, you know, this and this, a proper hook will come in where the person gets into an eccentric contraction which converts into a concentric movement, right? Uh, without eccentric, this can't happen. So any movement proceeds with stabilization and eccentric and then only comes to concentric. So eccentric has its own role, okay? Extremely strong, powerful people are so strong that the eccentric is short and they can use the stretch reflex. We'll be going through this later on where they just go back and convert it fast. A weaker person to throw a punch would do what? They would like go back and then throw like this, right? Because they don't have that control and eccentric um, strength as well. A strong person would do what? Instead of going back, they can just create power from here because there's enough stability and there's enough reversal from eccentric to concentric. You know, it can really have mm, fast. You know? So from here, if they have to throw a punch instead of going back, it can just go fast, right? So if that speed is coming where your arm moves, okay, this fast, you obviously have the stability and you have the control to throw it as well, right? From here, boom, fast, no? And as you can see, it does look nice, it looks fast because obviously I've got the training experience so I know how to throw. But if I'm weak, what would I do? I would have to maybe go like this, you know, wait and then sort of go like this. <laughs> So somebody who's not strong will throw a punch like this, right? This is how it goes, you know, not too strong because they sort of have to get first into eccentric, concentric, slow transfer. Somebody who's strong knows, stabilize from here in, you know, punch back, right? So when you can do that, even if you have to say maybe throw two punches, one, okay? Next goes fast, one, okay? You can just see that control, eccentric and concentric both come in together. Okay, so hope that demo sort of gives a bit of an idea. Yeah, yeah. But in this whole program now that we've sort of spoken about, we now get back to that picture of the tomato. And we hope to understand by now that you can't plant a mango and expect a tomato. And at the same time, you can't plant a pineapple and expect a watermelon. So the whole principle of specificity is this. You train for what you uh, gain and you gain for what you train, okay? So important to understand this and I hope this lecture is helpful and gives you guys an insight on what works and how to make it work. Nothing just happens by chance. You have to have a plan towards it, right? So you have to know what you want to get out of something so for that, you know, have to know what you have to do. So hope this lecture has helped by now and has given you some clarity and you can uh, definitely use this principle of specificity to make and gain specific results for yourself and your athletes. Thank you very much.